discussion. Um, most of you will have seen the exhibition um, in, the, in the two galleries here. Um, and what we'd like to, this to be is very much if people have got questions earlier on, we're not going to wait right till the end for questions. If people want to pitch in with stuff, that's great. Um, please do. Um, we've got here Mike Smith, who uh, I have a little uh, biography for people who don't know. Um, Mike trained as an artist at um, Campbell College, London, graduating in 1989. Um, producing his own artworks at that time, he exhibited um, and sold work, but exhibited at shows including BT New Contemporaries. Um, despite this success, after a while, Mike decided to establish Mike Smith Studio as a fabrication studio for artworks, effectively, going on to produce works for over 400 international artists, including a lot of artists um, associated with the Brit art movement, I think it's fair to say. Um, uh, the, probably the best known piece that um, you will have seen some of the form work for in the, uh, in the gallery across the way is Rachel White Reed's Monument, the extraordinary uh, plinth that was in Trafalgar Square in 2001, two? Um, 2001. 2001. So. 2001. And um, with us too we have Patsy Craig, um, who uh, obviously works with Mike in, at Mike Smith Studio. She studied fine art at um, Rhode Island School of Design and later printing and publishing at the London College of Printing. Um, Patsy has been co-director of Mike Smith Studio since 1998. Um, she edited the book, which some of you may know, Making Art Work. So is that? Not entirely correct. Well, do correct me. Come on. <laughs> we worked together on some projects. Okay, okay. Well, my notes are incorrect, but we'll clear that up later. Um, yeah, she edited the book, which you may know, Making Artwork, um, which is a kind of collection of interviews with some of the artists that um, Mike's Smith Studio has worked with over the years. It's a really fascinating document, actually, and I can recommend it to, to everybody. Um, she is now the director of Two, a subsidiary of Mike Smith Studio, which is... Um, devoted, it says here, to the studio's foray into design and other related fields, but I think this is exactly the territory we're going to be trying to talk about, um, first of all. But first of all, I thought it would be good, Mike and Patsy, if you could perhaps um, introduce us to the kind of reasons for the show and, and the kind of moment which this describes in, in the work of the studio, because... Um, do I need to use the microphone? Well, I mean, if people can hear... If, can people hear if I don't use the microphone? <laughs> but will the, will the microphone pick it up if I just speak anyway? Or so far. <laughs> Sorry? Not too far. I think you're fine like that. You don't need to yeah. lean right into yeah. it. You okay, because it just, yeah. Relax, so you okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the exhibition. The, the exhibition kind of um, came about... Um, well, essentially, we were asked to do an ex the studio was asked to do an exhibition before when um, someone else was working at the AA who works on AA publications. And um, I can't remember his name, but Mark Rappel, Mark Rappel. thank you. Um, and he said, oh, you should have an exhibition. And to be honest, I wasn't, I mean, it was a nice idea, but I didn't really think it was a good idea for the studio to have an exhibition because essentially I didn't want to do an exhibition that was essentially drawings, models, photographs and kind of, and that be it. Um, and whilst it could be argued that that's what this is, essentially what um, I was more interested in doing was uh, <coughs> making an exhibition of an exhibition, if that makes sense, in terms of um, having these kind of devices of wonder which showed um, the work that we'd done and related back to the work that we'd done um, rather than just having photographs and drawings and things like that. And I also wanted to do something else which wasn't necessarily something that the studio did. Um, which was just a project that would be kind of developed for, um, with the kind of the AA in mind, <coughs> or with um, just the general idea of the studio setting its own premise for making a piece of work, which 
essentially because it was the AA, it made sense to make it architectural, but it also made it sense to make it architectural in a few other ways, just in terms of things that um, I was kind of thinking about and um, that I was interested in pursuing. So that kind of, th that was sort of the premise under which the exhibition was kind of organized and taken on, really. And um, perhaps, perhaps it would be interesting to hear from you too about, um, I mean, th really this work describes a moment to the chain that, um, that you were described to me just before the talk as an experiment for the studio, as something that, that sort of moves the work on to, to become, if you like, a, a, a starting to provide, a, starting to work towards a set of tools for making work, for making design, rather than um, simply kind of, I suppose, reflecting and producing, manifesting the concepts of, of clients, effectively artists. Um, can you just talk a little bit about that and how that relates also to, to two, this, uh, this part of the office that you're now heading? Um, yeah, it's about sort of generating projects from within rather than just sort of answering to projects that arrive in. And um, this exhibition seemed to be a really good opportunity to do it. Um, the whole area of design is something that happens at the studio, I think, in quite an unusual and interesting way, and in a way that most people don't easily or readily associate with design immediately. So um, it's kind of just elaborating on what goes on there in a way that is um, slightly <coughs> different than the way things have been going on. Slightly different, though, in, in kind of what respect? Well, that it's generated from within. Um, the project is um, very much about a collaboration within the studio. I mean, collaboration, for example, is something that goes on with all the projects that happen there. And um, this particular project is very much about collaboration in my mind. Um, and it kind of takes it to a slightly different uh, area than the <coughs> collaboration that goes on with projects that happen that are generated from artists that bring work into the studio. When um, I interviewed you, Mike, uh, last year, um, you said at the time that, that the facilities, I mean, for those of you who don't know, or maybe haven't seen the, the book or the exhibition, the stuff in the exhibition, my studio is an extraordinary kind of warehouse, just full of kind of ways of making things, if you like. And and it's it's on, off the old Kent Road, and it's it's a real kind of it's a really amazing kind of facility, the like of which I'm not sure exists in, in many other places. But but you described at the time the facilities there as being all about vocabulary, about extending the kind of vocabulary of what was possible for, <coughs> for artists at the time. And, and do you, would you say that um, this work the what, what you're talking about now and what's in the exhibition moves that on, that the facilities are now being used in a different way from merely just extending that, that kind of vocabulary and way of ways of making? Um, yeah, it is being extended somewhat. I mean, it's not, <coughs> it's not that we're not doing what we've been doing for 15 years. It's that you know, we're looking at other things that we can do. And other things that we're interested in doing and other people that we're interested in working with. And also, just the, hasn't, the studio hasn't done, the studio hasn't designed and built an exhibition before. It hasn't done a work about its, or hasn't kind of really done anything about itself before. Other than the book. Other than the book. And it hasn't, it hasn't kind of generated its own project and so and basically everybody in the studio was involved in all of the projects and I think that that was kind of quite an interesting thing really because with the with especially with the piece upstairs the kind of temporary structure um, everybody had like different ideas as to how basically we had this big group meeting we decided this was roughly what we were going to do. And then everybody came up with different ideas as to how to design and develop and build this thing. 
and um, and then we ended up doing this particular one, but um, and that this one didn't really go as far as we wanted to go, purely because of kind of time restraint. In what really. um, I mean, what was the? But but in that sense, it sounds like what what you made was kind of a collaborative effort to make something in, in mm. a way, a kind of a first stab at that. But what was the kind of brief you set yourself, and how did you come to make this kind of form? Well, <coughs> the brief was to. <coughs> well, essentially, we first we want we decided that we wanted to develop a temporary structure, and that it should be scalable. I mean, and there was quite a lot more discussion about who it was meant to be for. Um, but in the end, we kind of tended to we tended towards this generic idea of a structure that could be scalable. Essentially, we wanted it to be able to be erected. Um, within two days, depending on how big it was. I mean, um, and we also wanted to do kind of real scale tests. I mean, the model upstairs is actually a third of the size that we wanted to build one. Right. Um, and essentially, the uses for it could be um, enormous. I mean, it was like a logistics center for a construction site was for an archaeological site, it was for kind of natural disasters, it was for temporary structure to go over kind of potential art projects, because we'd done kind of several outdoor art projects, and basically half the time we'd spent kind of sat in a shed waiting for the weather to clear, and we just thought, well, you know, why don't we build something that we could use as well? Yeah. So, you know, there were... I mean, we could kind of extend it into all these different areas, and it was really about utilizing kind of really simple things which already existed, which is, and then taking them into different places. You know, like we use, you know, bulldog clips and pneumatic pipe clips and standard tube and wire rope and um, all kinds of just sort of like fairly cheap things because we only had 12 weeks to produce the whole show and we had fairly limited means. And, and how does this kind of, uh, what, what strikes me as interesting about the difference between the two galleries is that while the lower gallery is showing, if you like, works that you've made in the past, the, the upstairs gallery is this kind of generic, almost generic structure which has a potentially, you know, infinite kind of um, series of applications mm. that, that it could have. And, and th your work in the past, though, has been all about making one-offs, I mean, very strongly kind of, you know, pieces of art, in fact, yeah. like, which are sort of editions of one. And now suddenly there's this impulse to make things out of, out of standard components that is potentially, you know... Well, actually, <coughs> within, within the work that we do f for artists, we tend to use a lot of standard components. I mean, we, because essentially they have to have a life after they're built, and therefore they need parts need to be replaceable. And if all of the parts are kind of, if each individual part is kind of precision machined, then if something breaks, then it's just like going to yeah. take ages to get it repaired. Whereas if they can phone up the company and say, have you got this? And they say yes, because it's a, you know, a regular component, then it just makes the sustainability of things which are meant to last a considerable amount of time and have like quite a lot of effort in terms of conservation put into them before they're made, um, it just makes their longevity yeah. kind of much more predictable. Yeah. Um, by the way, from about kind of now on, if anyone has questions or th things they'd like to interject in these bits, then do, because um, that's fine. Oh, in fact, do we have one already? Um, 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 well, just on the... Um, question of the structure upstairs, I'm interested that there's a sort of paradox between the work that you make yourself as your own work, such as upstairs, or the, the work that you make for artists, which is essentially about um, realising their ideas, um, not as an expression of the making of it or the construction of it, um, but in a way that the, the making or the construction is hidden behind the idea and the expression of the art object. Hmm. I'm just interested that, do you, do you see it, 
the, the joy of making your own work is more about expressing the, the actual fabrication? Uh, not necessarily, no, I don't actually. I mean, I think that the studio works in like a really wide range of um, kind of formats and materials and with all kinds of different facilities. And the, the piece upstairs is just much more experimental. And in a way, you don't, if you have 12 weeks to, to develop and make something, you, you're not going to invest heavily in having pieces made. So it is going to be much more kind of disposable and experimental. Whereas all of the other things that we make actually go through this process of experimentation and development in order to reach a, f a finalized stage. But whereas therefore they're being built for a particular time and place, they have they have those constraints on, so you have to reach a solution by a particular point. The, the structure upstairs, we, had to, we needed to resolve it significantly so that it could reach a point where it could be shown here and that it would hang from the ceiling and stand up and that it was a monocot and all of these kinds of things. But the kind of parameters are different. But it wasn't meant to hang from the ceiling necessarily. But well, no, it was <laughs> meant to hang from the ceiling because um, because one of the parameters was that the AA still wanted to use the room. So, um, but initi initially it was built to stand up the other way, but it was good that it would hang upside down anyway. In the way that you're talking about it and uh, in discussions I mean, we've had before, um, it seems like th that what it is in fact is a manifestation of kind of process and the process is becoming kind of something to be manifested. Not, I, I'm not quite sure about kind of how, what that exactly means when you describe it. I was wondering if you, you know, I mean, it's something you've talked to me about, and I was wondering if you might talk about it now, the kind of the contribution of process as something kind of tangible and therefore manifestable, or something you can make that, that kind of expresses the process of processes that, that the studio has kind of um, established over, over its years of being around. Well, I mean, I think part of the experiment was to see how in a way, how you can sort of push the idea of making and the idea of ideas, in a way. So how you the can... idea of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> so that, y you know, you know, on one hand, you're sort of working with materials and everything else in a really physical way, and then you're kind of working out the concept of what it's about. And obviously, the context of this exhibition allows you to play quite easily with that, as opposed to having a client that comes and says, well, I actually need this for this, and you know, blah, 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 blah. So uh, it was just kind of interesting also given the history of the studio that, you know, to some extent the work that gets produced there for artists is about uh, maybe ideas taking precedent over a process of making which maybe identifies to some extent their Involvement or lack of involvement with the production of the piece, but and, uh, just to, uh, and are you talking about a sort of specific group of artists when you when you mention that kind of attitude? Well, I mean, it differs with artists. Some get very involved in the making, and some don't at all. So, uh, and it uh, it doesn't isn't necessarily an indication of to me of you know how valuable their work is. Uh, I don't mean in economic terms, but so. You know, it's just the way people work and how involved they like to get in some kind of physical interaction with stuff. But it, uh, this piece was very interesting in, in that sort of playing back and forth and, you know, the idea, how, well, how can you generate design from a production starting point, actually? Um, and I think that's an interesting question. I think the question of working in collaboration to do that is also an interesting question. Yeah. So this will lead you to doing more of your own. Yeah, I think. I mean, I think the idea is to do more projects that are interesting projects. I mean, the work will continue with artists, and uh, hopefully, it will continue on other levels as well. But that's a whole other economy as well that you have to. <laughs> do you draw yeah. a line between clients and collaborators? I was talking about collaborators, and you mentioned clients. Is there? I think in the future there probably will be a line in a way, yeah. 
do you, at the start of the project, do you, well, that do you spot a client or do you spot a collaborator? Is there any? It depends on the. It de the it's entirely dependent on the project, yeah. because there are projects that we've done where we've been equal partners with structural engineering companies, glass companies, and artists, and it's been like a joint project between the four people. And part of the brief for doing those projects <coughs> is that it's been those, that, those four people, three people, or whatever. And so, you know, these things all exist. It's just, um, you know, a, the application of knowledge, really. This thing about collaboration, sometimes one presumes that artworks or making of the artwork in itself and that making makes that thing. And sometimes, I suppose, with the Whitley in particular, there's, um, you're making a mold, effectively. And the, 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 that molding process leaves you with stuff that's left over other than the artwork that's meant to be positioned or, or looked at or whatever. Do you, as a, an organization, feel um, more ownership of the meaning of those objects, and is that one of the things, this place where your, the meaning that you get from your work resides, is that why the studio is moving into this new territory? I could imagine that the, the stuff that went into <coughs> finding the models and making the models would be something that would break your heart to, to, to never engage with again. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think we get quite that sentimental about it. But, um, yeah, I mean, there is quite a lot of, you know, emotional investment in a lot of the work. But I think, essentially, what we're trying to do is, because so much of what the studio does is one-offs, we have this enormous resource, which, and what happens with that resource is that it just gets kind of like stored in boxes mm -hmm. and stored in the backs of people's heads. And so what eventually happens is that you just get, you know, cupboards full of how to do this and how to do that and um, brains full of how to do this and how to do that. And you just think, well, you know, why don't we take these brains and boxes and apply them to something else? Because the thing is, is that when you spend, you know, it's not, we spent three years working on the piece for Rachel, and we spent, it took 18 months to find a material to do it. And now, <coughs> supposedly, it's the largest water clear polyurethane casting in the world. And it's just sort of like, we put all that effort into developing this technique for casting that one object in this material which was completely ridiculous to cast it in. It was just sort of like absolutely insane. Um, but we did, you know, we did it. And then it's just sort of like, okay, so what are we going to do now? And we just sort of like scrabbled around for a long time thinking, okay, we've got all this stuff. What are we going to do with it? You know, we know how to, we know how to make these stupid, large, poly very beautiful water clear polyurethane objects, but you know, nobody wants them. You know, it's just sort of like you've invented um, this means of doing something which is kind of has this designed redundancy into, involved in it. And so, you know, it's a bit like people doing pure research at Cambridge into kind of some weird kind of amoeba. And they find out something about this weird amoeba and then they just think, well, what, what, are, what am I going to do with this? It's just sort of like, oh, yeah, fantastic. Its heart beats this quickly, you know, and it has eyes. We didn't know it had eyes, but, you know, what are you going to do with it? Do you see what I mean? What well, these? Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry. studios become like NASA. And show things up, would you engage in histories? I think that's one of the interesting things about the new place, in a way. It's, it, it's approach to itself. One of the things I wanted to sort of leading on from, I suppose, that conversation is kind of your relationship with um, or how the work might develop in terms of its form in the end. Because what's interesting, striking about that gallery over there is there's a massive bit of form work. And I suppose like what you've been making is, you know, bits of form work in di different ways uh, for, for years now. And now you're making 
design. So in fact, you're responding to Bruce as as a kind of uh, as a designer, and, and what that well, might imply formally <coughs> for, for your work, I suppose, is what I'm getting at. Well, I think that the st I mean, I think that it's a bit of a misnomer in terms of you know the studio has always the studio has always responded to the problems that have been set in terms of how do we design a solution to this problem you know design isn't something that kind of like it was just sort of like oh fantastic um actually great we're designers now it's just sort of like and we can all or wear you know black polar necks and <laughs> all the rest of it. I mean, it's just sort of and like... Have an exhibition at the AA. Yeah, and have an exhibition at the AA. I mean, it's just not... Yeah, it, it wasn't that kind of thing where we were just thinking, oh, hey, we're designers now. We're not, you know, it's like we have always been designers. We've always been intellectually involved in solving problems to, uh, you know, within a certain set of parameters. You know, the... The thing about what the studio does and what the studio does really well is that it comes up with solutions which aren't necessarily about style because, you know, a lot of people just design style. And, you know, and all of these things kind of have to function. And yes, they have a certain, you know, style about them, but... <sighs> Because of the range of work that we do, then we don't get kind of trapped into that. Have you? Do you think that the work? Um, <coughs> can you give some examples, maybe, of projects where of that kind of diversity? Because, because well, like, so um, okay, the simplest kind of almost banal thing that the studio does is that it, um, it developed an, a hanging system for aluminium prints, or for photographic prints on aluminium. And you're just, and everybody's just thinking, oh, well, that, you know, that's not so kind of like interesting. But it's just kind of amazing, like nobody, everybody wanted, like basically all of these photographers wanted prints on aluminium because they were so conservationally sound. And it was just, and they were really thin and flat and really beautiful and they didn't sort of curl up like poppadoms. Um, but nobody had figured out how to hang them on the wall, and so we just, you know, and actually we just figured out this way to hang them up on, hang them on the wall, and now it's just, you know, we kind of take it for granted, really. So that's sort of one thing. But then, um, that's kind of at the kind of amoebic level of what goes on there. And then we have like how to cast 11 tons of watercolor polyurethane at the other end, and then there's like a whole range of things in between, including. How do you design, how do you build a house in 15 days in the Devine Galleries at the Tate, which has um, ca huge catacombs underneath, and the floor loading is only a particular, um, it's basically about a ton and a half a square meter, which sounds like quite an, a lot, but when a house of the scale of semi detached, if you built it in regular m materials, would weigh about 70 tons then, you know, and you're not going to build it in 15 days. I mean, there's all, you know, these are all the things that people design, uh, people at the studio design solutions for. I mean, the other things are, which are kind of involved, that are more, involve a more intricate technology are things like um, um, selective laser sintering, which is a rapid prototyping process, whereby somebody wants um, this kind of filigree relief work or relief print um, that is totally impossible to cut or fabricate. And so we actually had them made by this process where they're basically printed with plastic and melted together with laser. And it was really beautiful. It was just like lace. It's amazing. I mean, it's just sort of like, but all of that kind of all of these different solutions to t entirely different problems come about because lots of people who work at the studio have spent kind of all the time they've been there figuring out how to do things. And it's a kind of technological expertise, but uh, in the way that yeah. you describe it. But, <coughs> but actually, it, yeah. But also, it's about <coughs> the application of technology and also about the combination 
of application of or the combination of application of different technologies whereby you know people don't think oh well we'll put this you know we'll put um, this technique with this technique with this technique to come up with this yeah and um, I was going to bring you and Patsy to talk a little about kind of one, one of the things about the book um, is that it has a lot of sort of verbatim commentaries from artists you've worked with, and, and some of the attitu attitudes of uh, of those artists to to what the studio does, are, you know, diverge and are different. And I'm, I'm trying to sort of imagine a, a situation for your work, wherein I suppose the work takes on a different type of client. So I suppose is the implication of, of what the work upstairs is about. But I'm wondering if you could talk a little about how some of the artists relate relate to to the work of Mike's studio and what and how they kind of, I mean, it's a shame Michael isn't here, but I suppose what I'm asking you to do is take on his, what he might have said, and how, how what they think they, they kind of get out of the collaboration, or whether indeed, you know, what sort of people are collaborating with you and the level of giving you a sketch and asking you to build something which are, which are kind of much more involved in the process and how those processes kind of work. I think it's really hard to speak for them. I mean, basically, I think they all come with a very different head, you know. Um, so... But for example, in the book, um, yeah. you know, you have uh, interviews with someone like, um, I think it's, uh, is it Mona Hartoum who says, you know, the, the kind of, thing about like studios you just give them the stuff and you trust them you trust Mike's monsieur to make to make your concept sort of faithfully somehow and it strikes me as a kind of amazing amount of faith to have in a have in a fabrication studio in, in that way but but then a, a sort of a more architectural client or a client that might commission the kinds of work that you know or the, that might create the kind of brief that creates the work upstairs might obviously have a very different relationship and I'm just trying to sort of ask you to talk a bit, a bit about those relationships, I suppose. I mean, I think, I think artists, you know, for example, the work that they do with the studio is not the only work that they do. So they've developed a, bo a whole body of work, a whole body of ideas, a whole trajectory of ideas that has nothing to do with the studio, really. They understand that the studio is, uh, can facilitate stuff that they are that is outside of their own realm to facilitate, basically. And that can be on all kinds of different levels. I mean, it can be um, something that is, you know, a particular material that they understand very well and know how to make it very well, or it can be something they've never done before. But, and maybe that's maybe war, the trust element comes in more to it. I mean, people know that Mike, for example, is pretty brilliant at figuring out how to do things. And so even though he hasn't done it, they kind of think, well, I'm sure he can do it. <laughs> so, um, but I mean, in terms of the other stuff, I think it's hard to, it's hard to talk about the future of what that can be. I mean, you know, maybe it'll just continuously be me drumming up interesting new projects like exhibitions or, uh, you know, I have a bunch of ideas which I'm not really going to go into right now, but... Oh, you could. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I mean, it's, so the artists, yeah, they um, have... I yeah. I just wonder if there's narcissistic possessiveness, though, about cause some of the ideas that are created, like Mike was saying about the polyurethane, I, th I think the whole, the, there's authorship issues which are not really issues, for example, because the authorship of those pieces are the artists. There's no question about that. But there is I think any time you work <coughs> collaboratively, there is this kind of, you know, I don't, all of us, if any of you have worked collaboratively, it's like egos, you know, they yeah. kind of are, I I, that was my like idea, no, that was my idea. They use these ideas further, because maybe it would, um, it would kind of lessen yeah, but the yeah, you know, there is this kind of um, yeah, but we have. I mean, 
the number of the number of people who called after we did Rachel's piece, mm. w the phone rang and rang and rang for months because people wanted these absolutely insane objects making in watercolor polyurethane. Um, the best one was a, an 18 meter long snake with um, LEDs in it that was actually going to be public seating in a town in France, which <laughs> I'm not sure if that was just the mayor's idea or someone else's, but um, it was just kind of, um, it was just crazy. I mean, people just thought, oh, fantastic, it looks so beautiful. Um, we want one. And there were other artists who asked us to make things. And again, it was just, well, firstly, how deep your pockets and, you know, um, what do you want, you know, are you really sure you want to, to get involved in this? Because it's incredibly risky. I mean, the risk involved with making Rachel's piece was absolutely enormous. And, um, but it was a managed risk and the I risk the was shared between different mm -hmm. people. I think the risk element is a big part of what goes on there that people are quite drawn to and especially, I guess, in the arts, because that's what most other places just won't do, you know. Uh, are artists protective of hiding how the things are made? For example, it's interesting that the, the closeness between Rachel Whitfried's work as being about negatives or um, impressions of things, mm. and the mould that you've created, which you could argue is an artwork in itself, it is the negative, it is the, the space. No, it's the negative. Yeah, it's the, the space in between Rachel's. Exactly. Yeah. So you, could say, <laughs> you could make a whole career out of that, yeah. or, or, or kind of get the tape to exhibit all the moulds. I don't know. But. Um, well, the, yeah. If but in a way, that's why we did the book and the exhibition, really, because there is this whole element of, to what goes on there that is really interesting and beautiful. You know. And then the artists are, are, are fussed about you sort of exposing the... Well, it's not, it's not... Um, making. It's not quite that kind of sensationalist, really. Um, you know, there is <coughs> a, a large part, you know, a large part of what the studio does is readily available. You know, it's just sort of like, if you go on the, if you spent you know, a couple of hours on the internet, you could figure out how to make a dirty bomb. Um, you know, but <laughs> you could... Uh, I didn't realise the studio made these. <laughs> so we've got, we've had quite, quite a few orders for the dirty bomb. <laughs> um, no, but it's just that kind of thing of that, you know, there is, there is so much, you know, there is so much knowledge available that it's kind of a, almost overwhelming. And what is interesting about what the studio does is it's the application of knowledge to provide design solutions to fabricating these kind of strange works of art. Is um, that what kind of motivated you to have the exhibition here rather than in an art gallery? Would you, what do you think the, mm. I mean, um, would you tour the exhibition to a, to a more sort of art related institution? Um, I think that maybe, but not as I art. <coughs> not as art. No, I mean it's you know it's not. I think that I think that the AA in a way is kind of um, the perfect space for it because it hasn't got that kind of like um, the design museum kind of fetish thing going on, and you know, and it's not got the sort of like not quite sure what this is aspect of if it was going to be shown in like an, in an, an, a more of an art gallery. I mean, I just think that, um, I think it's the appropriate place, which is why, you know, it was, that happened here really. Yeah. And for also, you know, um, I think that the AA kind of saw the interest really yeah. and had the kind of vision to ask. Are there any more? Are there any questions from the back? Maybe there's loads of you back there. You've been <laughs> filtering in <laughs> surreptitiously. 
Shimon's stroking his beard like he's got something to ask. No. Just a pose. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. There's one. Um, you aren't gossip. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, it's not sort of like anyone in particular, really. I mean, Rachel's piece was amazing, but um, in like a totally different way. Michael's piece was amazing, and then some of the much smaller projects have been really interesting. Um, I think that the most important things for me about working on things is that um, is just to do with kind of how challenging they are or stimulating or how interesting they are or actually the relationship that I have with the person um, and so, men so much of what the studio does is actually kind of based on those relationships really um, and also that's kind of why um, quite a lot of things kind of work out or don't work out. Um, but because you're dialoguing with Because of the, the dialogue, you, you understand what that. somebody wants. Sorry? Um. Um, no. no, because it's not, no. <laughs> you know, I'm not really that <coughs> um, committed to getting inside people's heads to, you know, <laughs> it's not like being John Malkovich. Um, <laughs> it's, it's much more about um, understanding what somebody, what somebody needs from a particular project, why they need it, and how best to achieve that within a set of parameters and also about being able to make, the, make decisions about how to reach those points in quite often a really short um, space of time. Because one of the whole kind of dilemmas of kind of um, contemporary art in like the late 20th century and the early 21st century is that a lot of the projects that the studio um, is involved in, um, they're not actually, they're, they're only made because there's an, exi uh, there's an exhibition where the piece is going to go. And basically, a lot of, you know, museum curators think that, you know, getting sculpture made is a bit like going to Sainsbury's. You just go pick it out and put it in your basket and check it out. But you know, do, you think, do you think in that context your, your work has, has encouraged a culture of the spectacle in kind of in um, large scale sculpture or in, in those kinds of things? Um, I don't think that the studio has encouraged it. I think that there is, I mean there is this whole kind of symbiotic relationship with a lot of clients who come to the studio and they see things and they get excited by what they see which may not necessarily be their own work, but hopefully it is. Um, and so they think, oh, that, we didn't know you did that. And they get really excited, or they see something and they just, and it gives them ideas. So it's just sort of like this whole other scenario kind of spins off. Um, but I just think that it's kind of the nature of making art, where um, in the period in which the studio has been working, whereby work is made for exhibitions. A lot of, I mean, we, there are a lot of people who we make work for, which isn't necessarily for exhibitions. It's for them to go and have in the studio, and then they work with it. But there is this whole kind of tendency towards purely making things for exhibitions. So the the and it's it can become quite uncomfortable because the artists haven't kind of lived with this idea, or they've lived with the idea, but they haven't lived with the, the realization of the idea f 
for a long enough period before the exhibition takes place. So it can become quite tense. And, you know, and then people want to make changes, and then it becomes, you know, and changes within the scale of some of the projects is quite an undertaking. And it's, you know, and it becomes, that becomes difficult. But it really, you know, it is kind of a dilemma of producing this type yeah. of work. Yeah. <coughs> Question that. that Um, yeah, they would have to negotiate <laughs> um, because ultimately if, the, if, well, throughout the whole process, there are kind of key stages whereby things, the majority of the project will be designed before it's built and, you know, and things will be kind of looked at and understood and signed off on throughout the throughout the process or samples will be made before anything even gets produced so that people understand what what it's going to look like you know how it's going to be finished blah 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 all of these kind of details which have to be kind of signed off on before they start so then you know if we if we build this kind of thing and they don't really like it, then, you know, that becomes a a question of, you know, them and their idea of what they were expecting or not expecting. And so then, you know, changes can be made, but then it, it may, begin, may just be a process of, like, throw it away and start again. Do you think that's going to be easy when you're generating Um, <coughs> now, I'll wear one of those kind of like um, <laughs> split costumes where I sort of have a grey suit on one side and a black suit, and I'll argue with myself. Um, <laughs> I don't. I mean, I don't. I. I don't know. I mean, I think you know we had to make compromises with the show. Um, I think over one or two things, but I think that uh, um, I think there's enough experience that sort of uh, helps the studio figure out how to, um, you know, organize how to realize something in a way that works. Well, I think we should wrap it up in a moment. If there's maybe one last question, if there's anyone with a burning desire. <laughs> <laughs> she more has got a burning desire. Just because I scratch my beard, I know. Good man. Um, we've, been, we've been traipsing across Europe and the last few months. No, we Not do a lot of we do a lot of work for solitary scratchy artists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so they don't do those drawings themselves. No, 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 we no, no. no. We just in terms of the range of work. I mean, the studio produces a lot of painting supports for painters. But also, scratchy drawy artists are also producing other kinds of things. You know, generally artists 
to, to a large extent, work in a variety of mediums now, um, perhaps in a way that they used to at one point, I don't know, whatever, but, you know, artists are working in different mediums, so then artists who's doing quite intense drawings may also, I mean, somebody produced those screens for Paul in the exhibition at Whitechapel, it wasn't the studio, but, and I don't think it was him, <coughs> but, you know, so it, it, again, it's not, you know, it's not like the studio is doing all in, of an artist's work, he's, he's got a few different kettles boiling. But there just seems to be something quite particular about you know, the, the, the 19th generation in terms of taking up a kind of, um, you know, Warholian spirit about the fact, about, you know, getting other people to make stuff and, mm -hmm. and um, in terms of like the old notion of authorship moving away from the, the sort of centrality of the hand that produces the thing, you know, and into you and yeah. if you like Starby and, and obviously, I mean, it's always been happening in, in the sense that the, um, to some extent, the, the, the sort of euphoria of the 90s YBAs has perhaps reached the pinnacle and things are moving on. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, the whole conceptualism and, I don't know, before that, Duchamp, I mean, you know, it has a kind of historical... But his I also think that a large part of that whole aspect of kind of the resurgence of studio, of kind of artist studios where people have either companies like the studio producing work for them or they have a lot of studio assistants is actually uh, predicated by demand for people's work. Like, you know, how, if you look at a space like Gagosian in Britannia Street, which is 14,000 square feet, you know, it's just like, how much work can you can a single artist produce to have a show in fourteen thousand square feet? If you go to New York and you see the spaces in New York, you know, and those kind of spaces are in exist in London now, and you know, it's just like the turnaround on people needing to produce work for shows means that you know one person isn't going to produce it. And That's so I part think of it. I think it's kind of sign of the times. Yeah. Sign of the times. Well, on that note, um, perhaps we can continue some <laughs> of these conversations in the bar. Um, I hope you hang around for a drink. Um, thanks to Mike and to Patsy and to all of you for coming down and being such good contributors. Um, and uh, yeah, go and see the show. We'll see you upstairs for a drink. Thanks. Yeah, no, it's fine. I mean, it was, yeah.